Committee for the grand year of 2014. For those that have not been to a meeting before, just so you understand how things work, is once we're done calling the roll and reviewing the minutes from last time, uh, city staff presents on an item, and then immediately following their presentation, the commission asks technical related questions. Once we're done with that, we open it up to public commentary. If you have something to say about it, item, please step up to the microphone, state your name and address so we have it for the minutes. Once people are done with their public commentary, then we close that and go back to the commission for discussion and a vote. And I would also ask folks, if you have cell phones, if you would at least silence them so that they don't go off during the meeting. We greatly appreciate that. And with that, let's call the roll. David Borsak. Present. <clears throat> Ed Bowen. Here. Jeffrey Tomes. Thomas Foytek. Here. John Hans. Here. Steve Cummings. Here. Kathleen Propp. Here. Donna Lurie. Robert Weigert, Carl Nolenberger. In attendance. Okay, and minutes from the 17th. Any comments, questions, corrections, deletions, additions? Move to approve. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Move on to item number one. Development plan review for the creation <laughs> of a multiple family apartment development on property located at 2490 Jackson Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Welcome. This is going to seem very familiar to the plan commission. Um, but to give you an idea of where the property is, it's on the east side of Jackson Street. Uh, address is 2490. It is uh, just north of Bacon Avenue. Um, you can see on the map the existing zoning is M3 for the property. Uh, there is a pending zoning that will be at council uh, for change on January 28th um, to go to an R3 plan development. And that was at your, your last uh, plan commission meeting you reviewed that. Um, but to, directly to the east is R3 multifamily. Uh, to the south and the north on the east side of Jackson are low density residential primarily. Uh, across the street, across Jackson to the west uh, is commercial and service uses. Uh, this is a very dark aerial of what's existing out there today. There's currently a single family home uh, and a former contractor yard on the site. Um, the site itself is about three and a half acres. Um, and as I had mentioned, uh, last October, uh, the Plan Commission conducted a workshop to talk about the viability of uh, multifamily uses uh, in the Jackson Street Corridor with the Comprehensive Plan recommending commercial. Um, Plan Commission did support the land use amendment um, to allow multifamily uses um, in the corridor. Uh, at the same time, they, you reviewed a rezoning request for the multiple or the manufacturing zoning to go to a multiple family district and the plan commission at that time placed uh, uh, plan development overlay on top of that as well. Um, so this, what's coming tonight is the plan development approval request or review request. Um, timing is, is pretty critical uh, for the petitioner and he can explain that to you when he gets up, but it's pretty critical that everything would go to the common council on January 28th. So the land use amendment, the rezone, um, and the plan development approval would all go at the same time to the council so everything can get wrapped up together. Um, so this is the site plan that's being proposed. Um, it's basically a 54-unit apartment building. And you can see here situated kind of the southern part, southern and eastern part of the site, uh, sort of L-shaped. Um, again, 54 units in that building. There are two six-bay garages um, on the north side of the site, a large parking lot, um, a couple outdoor amenities, playground, outdoor entertainment areas, some raised gardens. Uh, and a large stormwater uh, retention or detention area, and also the inclusion of a monument sign. The density for the development at three and a half acres um, and 54 units would be considered medium to high density. So it's a little bit higher than what our R3 code would allow. The R3 would allow 14.5 um, units per acre. Uh, this equates to about 15.6, so it is a little bit higher, and we're going to be recommending a base standard modification for that. Um, the development itself is designed to serve veterans, <clears throat> and it has a mix of unit types. It has one bedroom, uh, two bedrooms, all the way up to four bedroom units. Uh, there's other amenities inside the building, and I don't have the interior layout here, but the other amenities include community rooms, fitness centers, uh, media rooms, libraries, game rooms, uh, interior storage facilities. All the units would have balconies and or patios if you're on the first floor. Um, so a full range of an apartment community concept. Um, including the outdoor amenities itself. Access to the site is coming on one driveway off of Jackson Street. <coughs> Obviously entering the site, this is the main entrance of the building. Um, 
and accessing all the parking areas, including the outdoor recreational areas uh, and the dumpster enclosure as well. Uh, as far as site design and layout, uh, with a little bit of tweak, uh, a little bit of tweaks to this layout, all um, setback requirements can be met. Um, so there's no issue with any type of base standard modifications for that. We do want to point out as staff that curbing is required interior of all uh, parking lot areas, and uh, we're listing that just just as a informational item in the in the recommendations or conditions. Um, parking stalls count out at about 125. That includes the 12 garage spaces. Uh, that does a little bit over code requirement. And you'll notice pedestrian walks are included on the site, circling the, all the parking in the garage spaces, uh, the outdoor amenities, and then running out to Jackson Street. Now, Jackson Street at this area does not have sidewalks at this time. Um, but showing the pedestrian walk going out to Jackson leads for that pedestrian and, and in some cases, bicycle interconnectivity <coughs> when the sidewalks do come up on Jackson uh, in the future. Petitioner is showing a monument sign here on the um, western side of the site, right by the entrance. Does meet setback uh, regulations, um, but as you know, signage in our multifamily district is extremely limited. You've heard me say this probably 50 times. Um, they're limited to only about 16 square feet. So discussions with the developer and with staff, uh, we are recommending a base standard modification to allow a monument sign no taller than 10 feet tall, uh, with 100 square feet of maximum sign area. That would be 50 on each side. Um, and that the sign itself match the building as far as materials and design um, and that landscaping be applied around the base of that sign as well to kind of make more of an inviting entrance along with the uh, retention pond or detention pond. <coughs> um, landscaping, uh, formal landscape plans have not been submitted but what the petitioner did give us was a conceptual landscape plan. Numbers and species and uh, planting schedule would all come during building permit process. But a couple of things that I want to point out on this uh, is because of the, the low density residential to the north and the south, um, screening, plantings that are designed specifically for screening are on the north and south lot lines. Uh, more ornamental landscaping around the <coughs> detention facility and the Jackson Street facade to kind of give that inviting entrance, as well as uh, more ornamental landscaping on the eastern side um, as it's backing up to what will become a retention area as well. So this is the concept. You see the parking lot islands are landscaped. Um, uh, so he wanted to show that conceptual landscaping for you. The site will receive heavy <coughs> landscaping. Uh, the detention facility um, is shown on here as a conceptual layout. Uh, formal erosion control, drainage, and stormwater management plans would all have to be approved by the Department of Public Works during um, regular site plan review. But as you've heard me say multiple times before as well, we are recommending that the uh, detention facility be more natural in style and include emergent plants uh, in the safety shelf area and native plants in the side slopes rather than the use of the rock riprap um, for multiple reasons, not just aesthetics, uh, but also as a deterrent to intrusion, being a little bit more environmentally friendly and actually functioning better uh, than the riprap itself. These elevations are rough when you see them on the screen, um, but these are the elevations of what the building would look like, the front and side. Um, the building itself is three stories. It's 45 feet tall. Um, there's multiple roof, roof heights, as you can see on here, and facade plane offsets, as well as balconies, which are a little bit harder to see, but you can see the balconies coming off the units. Um, those are all designed to give the building some, some building articulation, kind of break up that long facade so it's, it's articulated in and out. Um, roof lines enhanced with a lot of cornice and freeze details of um, hardy freeze <coughs> details and five pond cornices, which are very um, high quality products and can be done very, uh, uh, I don't know, aesthetically pleasing, architectural. The building itself would also have aluminum storefront entrances, vinyl windows, uh, the, obviously the patio screen doors, um, and mixed material decks. But the primary building itself will be uh, red brick and uh, fiber cement siding. Um, this is a, not the building that's going to be going up there, but it's an example of what the building design would look like, um, including the color scheme. So this kind of gives you an idea of, of what that facade would look like in color, uh, even though this building is one story higher and doesn't quite match the same. But the petitioner did want to give you that idea. I believe he has some material samples with him as well. Um, and then finally, the two garages on site are very small. They're six stall garages. Uh, 
but the petitioner has come forward with the same building materi materials, primarily that fiber cement siding, but he is rip wrapping brick veneer around all four edges to tie those garages into the primary building as well, so they kind of match um, as far as the site goes. Um, these are some examples from other developments that they have of some of the amenities on site, the sort of the, the larger uh, detailed entrance, and then some of those outdoor recreational and grilling areas. Um, so with that, staff is recommending approval of the development plan for the multifamily apartment development with four um, conditions. The base standard modification to allow the increased density, the curbings installed along all parking lot facility areas, <coughs> the base standard modification to allow the 10-foot tall monument sign with 100 square feet of maximum area, uh, and that it's designed to match the aesthetics materials of the building with landscaping at its base, and that the tension basin is designed without riprap above the water line, and native plants on the side slopes and emergent plants on the safety shelf. Okay, thank you, David. Technical questions from the commission. Let's start with David, and I think I see Ed raising his hand. Uh, two questions. Did you say that uh, at least the first floor is brick? Um, yes. I don't know if it's kind of hard to see on here. <coughs> you can see this band along the first floor here would all be red brick. Okay, and that also be? <coughs> and also articulated on these columns on the, on the and, entry And the bay. portion that's facing uh, Jackson? Side elevation. The side elevation and the petitioner could probably answer that it would go all the way around. All right. Uh, the second question, uh, we now create um, a transitional yard uh, issue, uh, or do we, uh, between the adjoining parcels and who, who will be responsible for, uh, if, if that's true, who will be responsible for uh, the, whether the uh, additional uh, landscaping or um, setbacks? Well, the, the setbacks are listed on the plan, and they are, um, they are because of the, the well, go ahead, because of the... Uh, maybe I didn't say it. Uh, it, it when, the, when the adjacent properties are, are, are redeveloped, developed. Uh, I'm assuming that we, we wind up with uh, adjacent, uh, transitional yard setbacks and, and, and transitional yard uh, screening. Correct. It depends on the uses that go adjacent to it. If it's a use that's a higher intensity use, like a commercial use, they would be responsible for that transition. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. And that, I'm sorry. That if it goes to exactly the same or a lesser use, then they wouldn't have to do that. City okay. by an angle? Pardon me? City on an angle? Uh, south? Not to the north. To the south. But on the south. I mean, yeah. south so, I mean you've got flood control, right? You've got no structural concern about a transition on the south. Well, and to the, like the, the, like the building. Well, David, just one thing. You're correct. That that's a great question to ask. But right now we're not talking about the actual the zoning, the, the question of the zoning right now. We're, that's not before us right now. It's the, the plan development. No, no, I understand yeah. that. But but as a matter of course, mm -hmm. that uh, if we're envisioning that there's commercial development to the north or south, oh, okay, I get that. Uh, yep. Then uh, because the commercial would be a higher density, or higher, more intense use. More intense. Yep. Uh, and then the how we envision that development would put additional requirements upon the adjacent property owners. Then, then, then this, then this. Uh, well, you wouldn't really want to be imposing the requirement requirements on on this particular parcel. You might want to, as as the parcels develop to the north, if they need the additional relief, that would be the time to potentially bring them back through the process. And give them relief. Uh, and, from and I would shoot, do it differently, but that's a fun. Ed, you had your hand up. My question was uh, one you had raised earlier about the sidewalk, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought that through that there are no sidewalks on this portion of Jackson. We don't have to do a reservation or a dedication or anything like that. Is there ample? I mean, is there room? I believe there there's room. It? Is, is I believe there's room in the right of way, but at this area, you kind of have town, city, town, yeah. city, so there's not a consistent jurisdiction for the I installation. I guess as, as long as there's no objection from public works or engineering as to how we're doing this, I guess I wouldn't choose to put anything on it, but I'll leave that to <coughs> Steve's waving me off. So, right. well, And typically in these types of developments, we wouldn't even require the sidewalk to go all the way to the street. Right. We would just show it as a as a connection, and they could build it when the sidewalk goes in, or they could build it right away if right. their choice. It looks fine. I mean, to get out to the street. It looks fine. I was just curious as if there was anything from a mechanical standpoint. Techn other technical questions? Talked about this off the left. Okay, seeing none, anyone here from the audience to speak to this item today? 
Commissioner, would you like to see me? <clears throat> Welcome back. Thank you for having me again. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, as we went through the process last time, made the formal presentation for the zoning change, I think we went through the specifics of that. And uh, by request, uh, there is just some uh, additional details wanted specifically for the zoning of this property. And I put together, uh, with the help of David, the specific details for that. And then I also did bring in a couple of the material samples Great. for the development, if you guys would like to. Yes, we would sure. like to see that. actually um, some of the five pound material if you guys want to pass this around or take a look at it it's it's a very durable uh, long-term high quality material that is you know a piece that's used specifically for details uh, shutters also on the cornices you can kind of see up on the on the roof line um, I don't know if you, you want me to pass this around but everybody's most people have seen hardy board, uh, long-term material, 50-year warranty, paintable, um, usually holds its color for at least 25 years. Uh, this is what you'll see above the brick on the, uh, on the side. These are just some examples of the trim. This is the smart trim. So in areas around the windows, um, you'll see um, some of this, it's it's uh, it's an engineered uh, wood material with uh, wood grain finish. Also has, uh, I believe, a 25-year warranty on it. Um, very similar to what you'd see for a regular piece of lumber, but uh, longer lasting. And then this is kind of an example of the bricks. And I accidentally dropped this box, so this piece is kind of coming off here, but. This is uh, kind of what the facade would look like, but they're full brick pieces that will be used um, on the development itself. If uh, there's any other uh, questions that anyone on um, the commission had regarding the design, you know, I'm any questions for the okay, go ahead, John. <clears throat> um, can we go back to the color photo, the examples of the other? Okay. They had said that the this was the color scheme that you were going to go with. Is this identical color scheme that you're going to use? Because it doesn't show well on the black and white that we have. It's, it's, it's not 100% identical. Like if you were to look at the... Oh, my, yeah, cause my thing was the reds and the yellow. You know, yeah, the, yeah, it's going to be the very same. It's, it's going to be a very similar color scheme. But... Color for color, it's not going to be exact, okay. you know, to what's on that piece of paper right there. Just clarifying that. Yeah. One. Thanks. Other questions for the petition? As long as we have him here. All right. Anything else? I, I do. I do. Go ahead, Steve. I, I do have one question. You said there's a guarantee of like, what, 25 years. Yes, it is. I do like it too. What happens after 25 or 50 years? I mean, do they start to? What happens? After that, 25 years. Uh, I mean, it's just like uh, it's just like a furnace, you know. So you, you buy a furnace; it's got a 10-year warranty on it. Um, it doesn't mean it's only going to last for 10 years. It could last for 20, 30 years. Just the warranty runs out. Um, typically, what happens, you know, after you know, say 20, 25 years, uh, if the colors, it's mostly color fade uh, are the issues that you'll run into, uh, not really the deterioration of the materials. Should there be like an area on the building that starts deteriorating, that's something that we'd want to replace right away. But um, given the fact that they have the longer term warranty, it's not something we'd see in the short term. Um, but, uh, you know, so for repairs, uh, they'll be made as needed, of course, on the property. Um, and if the color starts to fade at some point, and I'm sure it, I'm sure it will, the property will be painted. If, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Anybody else here to speak to this item today? Okay, seeing none, back to the commission. Discussion, vote, etc. David. Uh, yeah, I have uh, one consistent concern that I have when we have uh, spot zoning, and that is uh, we are going to be putting additional uh, requirements uh, on the adjacent property owners for, for transitional yard. Uh, 
and and at least like people consider of that the, that the additional screening should be placed on the, the responsibility of this property as opposed to the the adjacent properties I also say that it was read in the minutes my 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 um, that I was that I didn't view this as an appropriate use when we were still waiting to see um, uh, what what our long-term plan was and what our design standards were going to be uh, for uh, for this this gateway area, and for that reason, not because I don't like the project, but I don't I don't like the land use and the in the short-term <coughs> spot zoning. I'm going to vote against it. That's that's just because of the process. And the only other uh, comment I'd like to make is uh, there there may be outright uh, that 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 uh, fellow commissioners. I uh, like the process, like the uh, I like the the land use and and the project, uh, but uh, I would only think it's caution is if anybody is doing it because time is of the essence, uh, uh, that troubles me. And uh, I think a lot of times in the past we have made bad decisions, be, you know, because of you know sort of these forced time issues. Thank you, David. Go ahead, Steve. One of the questions I look at this site. If, if I've got the right location, this was once a nursery, Lubke or Lubke Nursery. No, this was Boy, that's a long time. Okay, this is south of that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah nursery is just to the north. Off. Yeah. Okay. The Isn't the nursery that was just to the north where you were talking about possible drain, um, stormwater stuff? <laughs> like that? Okay. Kyle, did you have your hand? Yeah. I was just going to move approval with the conditions. Motion, but. Um, I'll second. And then okay. Come in. Yep. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, I wasn't here for the discussion last time about the project, um, but I like it, and I think it is not spot zoning. There's are there are apartments R three immediately east of this property, and I see on Jackson a possibility for a mix of commercial and multifamily as appropriate. So I'm going to vote yes. Other comments? I would have one. I, I, I would agree with Kathy, and I also, while the petitioner, I think you were very thorough, and it really addressed the, the, the we had a very good discussion last time, and I really appreciate your response. Go ahead, John. Um, I'm not going to go at length because I defended this pretty uh, vocally last time. Just want to say I, I really like the fact that we're going to have the part facing Jackson. It's actually going to be a green space in the middle of all these things that go through there. It's not going to be the building facing. It's going to be we're going to have green space. We're going to have that <coughs> pond there. So it's actually a nice break as you're coming in as we talk about beautifying our entryways and gateways into the city and more green spaces is one of those things that helps beautify the I also think entryway. The, more, the more public it is, the more likely it's going to be taken care of. Donna. I would just agree with John that I, I do like the project with the green space in front. I think that's very nicely done. All right. Anything else? We ready to vote? Okay. Hence. Aye. <laughs> Cummings? Aye. Rupp? Aye. Lori? Aye. Rollenberger? Aye. Borsak? No. Bowen? Aye. Boytek? Aye. Motion carry 7 to 1. All right, the next item on the agenda is the public hearing for the proposed residential design standards. Yes, uh, if memory serves, this is not something we will be voting on, but this allows people an opportunity to share their thoughts in public and for the record. That's correct. correct? So, yes, let me uh, reinforce that. Yes. Right here, we'll, we'll pass. Pass them around? Yeah, pass them around. <coughs> Do you have enough of those? Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Yeah, what this is, a, this is a new process for us, and it's a model that I actually I like. We're, uh, we're proposing to have a public hearing on the on the on the draft proposal for the residential design standards, and no action will be taken this evening. Basically, we open up we're going to open it up as a public uh, as a public hearing to take comments from the public. Then we'll close it, and then if you have any technical questions uh, that you want to raise at that time, we'll raise the technical questions. If there's something that we need to address before next week's meet or meeting in two weeks, oh, right. we can, we can be prepared for that. So tonight's just strictly a public yeah. hearing to take some comments and uh, listen to some technical uh, talk on, on the uh, item. The question, uh, the vote would be in two weeks. The vote? In commission vote. That is correct. Did people get this one? It seemed to come back in a large no. pile. I think no, they need to come this way. <laughs> I don't know if they got these or not. Yeah, we do. Okay. All right. David is just going to provide a brief. We got uh, a street note. Ed, Ed. 
I didn't get Good thing you're here. I didn't David is just going to provide a brief overview of what's uh, what's being proposed. It's just going to be an outline bolted form. He's not going to go over each and every one of the provisions. He's just going to tell you kind of what's out there, and then we'll open it, and then Tom will open it up. All right. Go ahead, David. Okay. Again, this is a this is just the public hearing. I'm going to give a brief synopsis of the of the uh, two sections um, of the design standards. <clears throat> Um, but I did want to tell you that we did have a workshop in December of 2012 uh, at the beginning of the process. The Planning Commission was invited to that. Uh, we did have a workshop between Council, uh, Plan Commission, um, Landmarks Commission, Sustainability Advisory Board uh, in December of last year, uh, beginning of December. Um, there was an open house last Wednesday, Senior Center. It was well attended. Um, and so we're hoping on February 4th to bring this for the Plan Commission for review, discussion, and, and potential recommendation. Um, and then follow that up by going uh, to the Council. So uh, basically it's broken down into two sections. One is a, a universal or citywide design standard that would apply to all single and two-family structures. <clears throat> and the second is an overlay, a uh, traditional neighborhood design overlay. So I'm just going to go super quick over this so we can have the time for the public comment. But it addresses really three main items for the citywide design standard. That's the existing buildings and principal structures. And it really deals with windows and doors and not allowing them to be covered or closed or filled. And it limits the location for decks and patios to the rear or side facades and requires decks to have posts, rails, balusters, uh, and hidden fasteners. Um, and then for existing buildings, additions or major changes um, to a existing single and two family structure. Uh, I would say materials could be modern materials, but they must be complementary and tie into the original building. Uh, additions would have to be placed on the rear side of the building, not the front, uh, unless it's considered architecturally compatible. Uh, additions shouldn't be any higher than the dominant roof line of the existing building or exceed the existing building's footprint by more than 50%. And facades facing the public street uh, must not create a blank wall, so they would have to have at least 25% of their wall area be devoted to doors or window openings. Um, and then it addresses infill construction very briefly. Uh, that basically houses street presence, and that's, that's the front yard setback, would have to align with the prevailing setbacks on the block, and more specifically with the houses on both sides. So it would have to pull up to that building line. The overlay or model code design standards would be applied to specific areas, um, and that's described out in the, in the overlay code, um, either as an adoption of that model code, traditional neighborhood overlay, or as a planned development overlay. Um, now, the, the overlay design standards could be augmented as it goes through the process. It would come through just as any other overlay comes through the plan commission, city council. Um, could be augmented, could be changed. Um, what's in the model code is really designed for homes that were styled before 1950, typically built before 1950, a set style of homes, the Queen Anne's, the Victorian's, the uh, American Four Squares, bungalows, so on and so forth. After 1950, there would be a whole different set of standards that you would have to address um, for housing styles after, after the 50s. Um, and for that aspect, we would use a plan development overlay and do a specific set. Uh, but what this deals with is the same type of thing, existing buildings, uh, additions and major changes to existing buildings and any infill construction. Uh, so for existing buildings, you'd have to maintain the existing window and door systems um, or have replacements that are compatible with the housing style. Um, original porches, stoops, uh, and patios uh, should be maintained. Replacements would have to be compatible with the style of the structure once again. Uh, at least 60% of the existing porch must remain transparent rather than being closed off. Um, decks and patios would be located on the side and rear elevations and not on the front. Um, for additions and major changes, they would have to, again, be appropriate to the existing house's design, character, style, and form. Um, additions should be on the rear and side facade. There are exceptions to put them on the front if it meets the architectural quality of the home. Uh, but they shouldn't be higher than the principal structure or more than 50% <coughs> of its footprint. Uh, they should reflect or be consistent with the style and roof form. Uh, modern materials can be used, but they should be complementary and tie that addition or that major face change to the existing house. Um, and then again, 25% of any new additions, wall space facing a public street should be devoted to windows and door openings and not be blank. 
and then fill infill construction, so new construction in an overlay district. Um, setbacks would have to be consistent and align up with the block. Um, we would allow side and rear yard reductions for special circumstances uh, that the code doesn't allow now. Uh, should not exceed surrounding structures in height by more than a story. Um, the front elevation and entrance should be oriented to the street and not on the side of the rear of the building, the primary entrance. Um, it should reflect or be consistent with the architectural style found on the block in the neighborhood of your infill. Uh, materials, again, can be modern, but they should be visually compatible with the block in the neighborhood. Windows and doors uh, must make up at least 25% of the street elevation uh, and be representative of window patterns found in the block and in the neighborhood. Uh, garages and carports should ideally be on the side or the rear of the building, not on the front of the building in a traditional neighborhood. Um, and they should be designed as an integral part of the principal structure. Um, and we also allow in this overlay uh, some new driveway types and some alternative materials for driveways. So that is a really, really super brief overview of both the, the overlay uh, model and the citywide design standard. Um, so with that, uh, oops, I guess we're open for, uh, for public comment. All right, I'd like to open up for public commentary. Folks, again, if you have something to say, please come on up to the microphone, state your name and address, and tell us what you think. Hello, my name is Jennifer Sundstrom. I'm with the Realtors Association of Northeast Wisconsin. I do have our association's comments in writing that I can Thank have you. copies for the plan commission, and I will not go through the entire memo with you, sure. just highlight some of the details. We do appreciate the opportunity to present our comments to the Plan Commission. We believe that the changes from the original proposal make several important improvements towards balancing the rights of individual property owners with the city's overall goal of maintaining neighborhoods and the existing housing stock. The most important element, I would say, of our association's um, concerns is the request that the ordinance include language which would amend the application process to require about 75% of the affected homeowners in a traditional neighborhood overlay district to proactively <coughs> sign onto the application before it's accepted. We've been to several of the public hearings and city staff has affirmed that the intention behind this process is to not proceed with a traditional neighborhood overlay if the majority of homeowners are opposed to it. However, we feel that putting this actual language in the ordinance is going to um, reinforce a process in which homeowners are actually coming together in a proactive way to talk about their neighborhood, the intentions of the neighborhood, educate themselves and their neighbors about what the ordinance is and how it would be implemented, and then move forward together rather than having a reactionary process where sometimes neighbors can be, maybe feel like they're being put on the defense um, before they've fully understood what's going on. I think it would be another way to bring neighborhoods together um, rather than potentially having an element that could be divisive just amongst <coughs> neighbors. Um, we do understand as an association, as we're talking about the percentages that would be required on an application, that some variation may have to take place in certain neighborhoods where there may be a very low percentage of owner-occupied units, um, and that's something we'd be more than willing to sit down and talk about. But in those instances, we think 75% of at least owner-occupied um, properties that are affected would put it at a percentage where at least the majority of of the homeowners are working together. One other element that we wanted to um, bring to the Plan Commission's attention, it's not necessarily about policy, but simply about wording. Um, there are two different places in the ordinance under applicability. One is existing buildings and one is porches and decks. There is some confusing language that we're hoping the Plan Commission will address. In the first sentence of it, it talks about the fact that the new residential design standards in a TNO would um, be triggered at l large projects, 50% or more of the front facade. But then if you look at the language, the next sentence talks about how the design standards would be triggered with any change. Our member sent and talked about how do you, what is the trigger point? We do understand the difficult position where homeowners could do things one window at a time, for instance, to avoid the trigger of a large project. We did not take a position on which one of these um, should be the policy of the ordinance. We just think the language needs to be clarified so that whether it's for 
public hearing purposes in front of the city or when neighborhoods are starting to look at wanting to have a TNO, everyone's on the same page and understands exactly what the ordinance means and what the intention is and what the trigger will be. And we just think that language is a bit confusing. Our association does greatly appreciate the effort that the city has made to solicit input from realtors in the community and we look forward to working with the city staff, the plan commission and members of the council to uh, resolve these final issues and concerns. It really is the goal of our association um, to be able to come forward um, before the <coughs> final ordinance <coughs> is adopted, stating the association's support and approval of the ordinance. And we're hoping to address this final concern regarding how an application will move through the process. Thank you very much. Next person, anybody else like to speak to this? Who's next? Anybody else? There we go. Thank you. Tell us your name and address. Hi, I'm Deb Lederhaus. I'm with the Winnebago Home Builders Association. And I'll just take a minute of your time. I would like to um, also stress on the uh, percentage of the um, neighborhood acceptance and buy-in in advance and the clarity of the language so that as remodelers or builders in the area are looking to work with their clients in those areas that it's it's clear for them uh, in how they need to determine those things. So I just would like to stress that and appreciate your time. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Officer. Hi, my name is Aaron Steele. I uh, am uh, a planner with the Brick Industry Association located at 414 South 17th Street in Ames, Iowa. Um, just a real quick explanation as to why I'm here. Um, the Brick Industry Association employs a staff of community planners to help communities exactly with this sort of thing, with design guidelines, design standards. Um, we do that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because communities that have high, high expectations for development, uh, we sell more brick in those communities, plain and simple. Um, also, uh, because these brick, existing brick structures in your communities, when they are maintained well, preserved well, additions are done well over time, that's the best advertisement in the world for us to have those buildings continue to look great 100 plus years after they are built. So, um, again, I'm, I'm with an association of clay brick manufacturers and distributors, and uh, I'm a community planner who works in design standards and design guidelines every day, and I'd just like to applaud you for tackling this. It's a big deal uh, and difficult to work out all those logistical kinks. I would just offer that, um, at least as far as my industry is concerned, and to a smaller extent, masonry in general, if we can be any assistance in helping you, um, helping your property owners ensure that an addition to a brick home, for example, is well tied in, finding a brick match, dealing with historic, historic mortars, you know, all those kind of technical issues, we would love to help in any way we can. We have an engineer on staff, actually several engineers and planners, and so um, uh, generally we, we support any, any uh, policy that advances good design and development in your community. So thanks. Aaron, can we get your card, please? Absolutely. Anybody else here to speak to this item today? Come on up, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Schmidt. I'm in transition right now, 1280 West South Park, 1025 Bayshore. Um, probably reach me at either place. I also um, am a realtor here, have been for a long time in the city of Oshkosh. And um, I, I just want the, um, the group here to understand that the Realtors Association does appreciate the work that's gone into this, drafting this, and, uh, and uh, that we are in support of improving the housing stock here in the city. Um, but I also endorse what the two ladies ahead of me stated <clears throat> about the clarity of uh, 
some of the language here. I think that's very important so that when it gets to the enforcement of the plan that it's understood and that some future decisions um, based on somebody's opinion doesn't have to be made. So the um, um, so so that's one of the items that I wanted to address. Another one is the uh, uh, in addition to the clarity, the the term owner occupied, and um, and and I've I've heard some some um, um, difference of voting rights for an owner occupied. Uh, property owner versus a vacant or a landlord um, ownership, and I don't exactly know what those differences would be, but I have heard some discussions about that. And then the other item that uh, that I am also wondering about is I know there are, I think in the old days they were bid. Um, uh, Grants, uh, federal grants, and I don't know if that's the same thing. Same thing that's being applied here, but there is money. There's going to be a fund of money, and the council, I believe, set aside two hundred fifty thousand also to help the low income. And my question is: um, is what will happen when these funds run out? If somebody, if if some structure. Uh, has a safety hazard, something that, that's important. If it's a replacement of a window or a door, that probably can wait until funds are available. But if, if something is needed immediately, what is, what's the proposal at that point? What would, what would happen? So just some, some items that I throw out for the, um, for the commission's uh, um, consideration. Thank you very much. Sure. Anybody else here to speak to this item today? My, my, uh, my name is Gary Gray, 815 West Linwood. I just want to make the uh, point in regards to I, I, the percentage of uh, approval of uh, rezoning or having these, these uh, designations made. I think, the, uh, I think a percentage is, is a good idea. I think it needs to be clear to uh, also a percentage of what, homeowners or all, all building owners? It seems to me like, like the p potential problems would be with the non-homeowner, uh, bu buildings owned by non-homeowners, uh, non those that are rented, those are owned by people mm -hmm. outside the city, and that the uh, homeowners in general would be more conscientious in maintaining their own house. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Anybody else here to speak to this item today? Okay. Seeing none, I think we're done with the public hearing. It's now closed. And would you like some feedback from us? Uh, technical questions, if you have any. Do we technical. have any technical questions based on anything we heard today or previous thoughts? Ed and then David and then Kathy. Um, I haven't, and I, I don't, we've sort of discussed this a little bit, but have you settled on any mechanism for a percentage of, of applicants or, or any differentiation. <clears throat> so you're not quite there yet if you're gonna if you're gonna do it at all with a percentage of people applying for a, a traditional neighborhood overlay? No, at this point for two reasons. One, we're not you know, I've I've been discussing it a little bit with the city attorney, we're not sure about the legality of that. Yeah, I don't know what's been drafted. And secondly, that would be a it would be a change in city policy. I mean, if somebody comes in, we're doing a, we're doing an area-wide rezone to C2, R1, R3. We don't require a percentage. We don't require any percentage of the property owners within those districts to support the zone change. We know if they don't support it because they come out and they'll show up at the council, and the council will take that into consideration. We do know, however, that if it if 20% of the property owners that are involved 
sign a protest petition and submit that, that will that forces a, a supermajority of the council to approve any type of zone change. So it moves from a simple majority to five votes at that point. So if so, if you if you left the ordinance sort of as conceived at the moment mm -hmm. with a you know, a, a lone petitioner could theoretically petition for, for a traditional neighborhood overlay. Mm -hmm. There's the backstop, sort of that, that safety valve, if 20% if <coughs> of the properties impacted by that request, yeah. that would force that to go to the council, and the, the, there would be a three-fourths majority at the council required to over... Five of the seven. To, to support the petition or to Correct. overturn the petition? No, to, well, to, to support the petition. Okay. It would require, so it it wouldn't, require five. So that, that thing that was protested, that uh, request that was protested, wouldn't be able to pass without a 75%? Correct. So even if you don't do a percentage, there is a, a relatively low bar for protesting something if, if the bulk of the neighborhood is against it. As it as it may turn out that the bulk of the neighborhood was against it, from a statutory standpoint, yeah, and and that's something that's in the state statutes, correct. not in our no. ordinance. That that's not within our control. That's correct. I, I just want to try to understand how. I just want to follow up on your thought real right. quick, seeing as we're on the topic. <clears throat> Strictly twenty percent. Is it rounding up? Is it you know? Do you understand? You know, what if the neighborhood comes out to eighteen point nine percent? Twenty percent. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> just wanted to just wanted to clarify. Okay. Twenty percent. Twenty point oh oh one. You know. Okay. Somebody needs to go buy a quarter acre. David oh. Nankan. You know. Uh, had a question uh, regarding the trigger, uh, just on the um, uh, on the the standard uh, draft universal citywide. Is that start with um, window one, door one? <clears throat> That's the, no. Okay, and, and I, I just wanted any, to make sure. That. Let's start with any change. Any change. Thank you. Kathy. Um, the trigger is my concern also. Um, on the universal standards, it says major change, 50% cumulative change. That facade, the same with the overlay code. Um, not going to be popular in this room, but I'm thinking that's too high. A trigger and because of the one window one door issue you know this <clears throat> these are pretty simple standards I don't think they're onerous standards certainly not on the citywide where it's don't board up a window or a door for all price um, I think we want these standards to um, to be appropriate to to be used if a neighborhood decides it wants an overlay. Uh, we don't want I don't want fifty percent to be um, undermined. I don't want inappropriate renovations, window at a time type of thing happening. And so I'm raising the question, and I'm not, we don't need an answer tonight. Yeah. yeah, and I would concur. And that was the basis of my question. And the answer to my question was different than what came back from Kat, that it's not one window, it's 50% windows or doors. It's a 50% cumulative change to that facade. Okay. In the yeah. Overlay, so, in the overlay. And, and so I would concur well, that, 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 or that, for additions. that that you get uh, the death by a thousand cuts then, uh, up to 49%. And and, <coughs> and the. Um, and deciding what is 49%, I guess. That's say. correct. And, and, and as a general comment, I'll, I'll say right now that while one window, one, one window, one door, May not may be unreasonable. That's where I'm going for the that the that the trigger is one window, one door. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to, to to ask Darren and David because I think we talked about this after the open house. But this, as this as this sits right now, 
isn't going to be written in stone. This is something we're going to revisit again to make sure things aren't happening like the one window, one door trying to sneak under and seeing if percentages work. I mean, the things that we have that are in here, it's not like this is etched in stone and this is what we're sticking to. This is our starting point, correct? Well, this is, this is what you what I'm, you're not, I'm not saying it's, in, I'm, it's imperfect. I'm just saying you always learn things oh, before you implement. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, we always have that learning process. We have to start, we have to start the journey with some <laughs> steps. So we're, we're, the proposal that we, ha that we have that we thought was arrived at through, you know, a lot of consensus, that 50% number, I think, was, you know, it wasn't, everybody in the group and that stakeholder group wasn't, you know, wasn't always happy at the 50%, but it was a number that we thought we could work with. Now, we always like to re re retouch on these things in a year or so just to, to, just to evaluate them and see if we, if we need to fine tune them. But, you know, we ha at some point we have to make the, we have to move forward and actually adopt something so we can see what's working. And that's not saying I'm, I'm for putting a lesser thing on mm -hmm. the beginning. I'm just trying to understand, you know, we ha this, is, this also will be a work in progress. This is something we'll be seeing a lot. I think it's a conservative proposal, so we always like to start out. We 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 don't like to over overreach. We like to start a little bit on the underside and some of these, are, you know, more more conservatively, so we can always ratchet it, fine tune it which way we need to. David and Darren and their staff are still learning and growing. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'm learning anymore, but yeah, I'm growing. Other thoughts from the commission? Go ahead, Steve. Um, the the seventy five percent that's being discussed or proposed, I think, is is a percentage designed for failure. Uh, you look at some of our neighborhoods that are heavily uh, rental. <coughs> it's, it's a number that's designed to, be, to, to fail. Um, there's very few owner-occupied rentals in the city. I'm thinking of two-family or duplexes. Uh, what do we do with the owners that live in... We don't even know where they live. It's, it's a chore to track them down for anything. I mean. Do we count, what, what do we count that non-vote as, a vote for or a vote for, against? Um, uh, there are certain neighborhoods, uh, probably a little bit more on the south, the older part of the south side, where it's heavily owner-occupied. Uh, this section of town, it's heavily uh, rental, and again, not owner-occupied rental. So I think we've got to really look at that number carefully and ensure that it's a realistic number that will make this program a success. Well, we're not even sure. As, as I said, when I start out, we're, first of all, it's, it, that would be a change in city policy. I mean, it's not like with any other zoning district when we apply it, we don't have a trigger number in that in that zoning district. Secondly, that 75, if it's 75 percent of effective owner, homeowners, and I'm looking at a neighborhood that has what, two home or three homeowners in it, and two or, or all three of them support it, and the rest of the block. It could be a number that's actually easy to hit, but I don't want to actually what, for 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 neighborhoods that have lesser uh, owner occupieds in them. It might be a number that's easier to hit, but again, I don't think it's legal, and I, I and I well, we're not sure if it's legal. Let's so to talk to the attorney <coughs> about that. But secondly, that would change city policy with respect to how we handle zone changes in the community and how we how we did how we handle zoning district changes. So that's where my opposition would be. Gabby. Um. I don't support at all uh, a percentage of properties signing on for some very good reasons. First of all, this it's really a political decision. A group of homeowners will, one, maybe several, will decide they want this overlay. They'll come to staff. They'll work it out. They'll talk about it. They'll have neighborhood meetings. I think a consensus will form. And or not. Come to the plan, or not. Or not yeah. Then they'll come to the planning commission, and we can make a decision about whether whether we think it's appropriate, whether enough people are in favor of it. Ultimately, the city council will make that decision in a political way, and they'll be very good at it. And they can decide if there are enough people that want this. We don't want to put a number into the ordinance, whether if it's even if it is legal. So we don't need to. Ed? I, and Carl? This, I guess this is, sorry, Carl. I, that's sort of the, I guess maybe the first that I've heard about the legality of establishing a threshold of applicants is is that I guess is that something we're looking I mean I'm assuming you're looking into is that something you anticipate having some feedback for prior to to the fourth when we consider this we'll have it but remember I mean just as you think through this we as a staff we initiate zone changes right. without, and the council I'm, I'm not saying I agree with it changes. I'm just saying I'd like to know 
Yeah. No, we're, we're, we're requested and we're you know, for us to consider. On question. I'd like to make sure that we have that answer yeah. prior to yeah. having it in front of us. I guess. Okay. Right. Well, we plan for the for the next plan commission the discussion <laughs> meeting where you'll get the PowerPoint and everything like that. Um, we'll have a supplement that'll go with the staff report that'll have uh, <clears throat> items of concern that have come up throughout the process for you to all take a look at and kind of make your recommendations on. And ultimately, okay. once again, all those go to council for their decision. Ah. Yeah, we're listening to the discussion. I just have to admit it's kind of changed my perspective and my opinion. And I'm at the point, because I sat there counting in my head the number of rentals on our block, you know, which is in the old area here on Frederick Street, it's 60 percent. The more I thought about it, I started, I'm at the point that I'm agreeing with Kathy's <laughs> position that it should not include the percentage. It should be a decision made subsequent. Ah. Uh, yes, I, the discussion too brings up some points that I think are interesting. Uh, I think that the people who live on the block or in the area should be the ones who have the most vote. Um, you have people who are owning property and renting them out, and they are not in the area. They don't live there. They're renting, and who knows what their um, value system is for those properties. It should be the homeowners who are living occupied that should have the most say. As far as I'm concerned. I agree with that, but I was also sitting there thinking that two of the renters on our streets have rented there for 18 years now. So they're, they have a strong sense of ownership of the block, let me tell you. <laughs> it's stronger than some of the owners. But at the same time, some of the other renters do not, just as your concern is. You? Oh, no, sorry. Other thoughts? <laughs> God, no, just, I don't just one comment on what, what Don had said. I've never, I, I've been here for a lot of years. I don't think I've ever seen the council adopt a zone change when, you know, the vast majority of people have come out. I don't think the plan commissions adopt it when the vast majority of <coughs> plan commissioners or council. I think, they, I think they're reasonable. They'll take everything into account. They'll look at the reasonableness of the request as they always have. So well, that's... Well, and I would add that I think getting back to what Kathy said, that if the... The way you created this, using this, this is a model, this kind of process, then more of a consensus emerges. It's not to say everybody's going to be happy, of course not. But if the process is done properly, yeah. you don't need percentages. You try and build consensus. And the final product, hopefully, has everybody's hand footprint in it or yep. thumb print, whatever. Other thoughts from the commission? Go ahead, Just Steve. Just one final comment. Um, and, uh, well, you know, compliment the staff on the. the Great job they've done this. This is agree. sort of a thankless task. I think you've had to you've had to round up a lot of people with different opinions to bring this all together. Uh, and from my standpoint, you know, uh, being on the council, I probably get I will get more emails or letter <coughs> calls than most of you. But uh, anyone I run to into the gro at the grocery store or the, wherever you see people. The citizens, the taxpayers, the homeowners of this city like the direction this is taking. They may not totally understand it, but they're glad to see that we're trying to protect the equity they have in their homes and their investments. And I think uh, I, we've, we're taking a, a major move forward. And I, I, you guys have done a great job, so thank you. Well put, John. And I, I, I want to I want to second what uh, Steve said, and also say that I think. City staff really is showing the community that they learned a lot after the Near East neighborhood and how they tried to force the square peg into their own hole and get everybody on board now. I, I think this, this is showing that the city does listen and that, you know, that the, the current staff that we have now pays attention to the things that come in from the public, from, from the homeowners. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's great to see something like this coming around because was it, was it five, six years ago, I think, was it the, with the Near East, I think? Well, five or six. Longer. I mean, that's that's pretty quick turnaround. All of a sudden, come up with something that takes you know that's that's for the whole city, and all of a sudden you have people actually complimenting it from all different areas. They may have their own issues with it or everything, but you're going to have that with any plan. So, I mean, do our best to try to work these things through, which obviously we've been doing, and I, I think this is going to be a very positive step forward for the city. Other last thoughts? We'll do adjourn. <laughs> For a second. <laughs> we don't have to take any action on it, do we? All those in favor? <laughs> well, it's good to be kidding. Oh, I mean, I... I... I...
All right. those in favor again? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? All right, we're adjourned. That's because you saw